Go. Right then. <laughs> so, as has been introduced, uh, tonight I will be talking about monad transformers and a really interesting way that we can use them. But wait, what's that I hear you yell? Ben already <laughs> told us about Ben already told us about monad transformers. We're already experts on that. Tell us about something else instead. But you're wrong. You're not yet experts on monad transformers. There are there's all this other cool stuff that you could be doing. I'm going to show you tonight, hopefully, how to do it. So before I start talking about any technical detail, I'd like to talk about some motivation behind what I'm going to what I'm going to say tonight. So, you know, I mean, the goal of every functional programmer is to one day get a job writing a compiler, and then <laughs> we can drive this stuff to its full potential. But for some reason, we're all stuck in jobs where we're, where we're passing all these configuration parameters around, and we're handling error conditions, and we're maintaining like some piece of state somewhere, and we're like performing I/O because we need to launch a missile. Um, we're writing out all these log files. We're doing all these really crazy things that we wish we didn't have to do. And we need some way to, to wrangle them all. We need some way to sort, of, to sort of deal with all of this stuff in a sensible way. Um, tonight, I don't have time to tell you about all of these things. I'm just going to focus on passing configurations around, handling errors, and performing I.O. effects. Uh, but the principles and the tools that I'll show you uh, extend to these other things as well. So, those are our motivations. What are our goals? We want compositionality. That's goal number zero. That's like, you should wake up in the morning and think to yourself, how am I going to compose things today? <laughs> like, if that's not your first goal, everything you do is going to fail. Sorry. Um, and we want types to help us, because that's what they're there for, and they're really, really good at it. Okay, so with these two goals in mind, we can move on. I'm going to tell you all sorts of lies tonight, and you'll have to deal with them. I'm going to tell you these lies because they make it easier to explain certain things. All right? But I'm going to maintain the invariant that any lie I tell you is small enough that I could explain it over a beer. And I challenge you to hold me to that. So let's talk about transformers. At the moment, we're just going to focus on configuration passing and error handling. So we'll build up some example types, and then they'll recur throughout the presentation. So we've got our DB config type, which has some kind of database connection inside of it, and it'll give us a bit of information about the schema as well. Right? We've got this network config thing, which tells us what port we're running on, and has some SSL stuff in there. I don't know. And uh, we've got our sort of higher level app config, which has both a DB config and a network config in it. Okay, And then what about our errors? Well, our database might give us some errors. So maybe there'll be some kind of query error, and then we'll get back some text. And all we can really do with that text is sort of wrap it up. Or we might have some kind of invalid database connection, and that'll give us some kind of error, right? What if there's a network error? Something might time out with the number of seconds that it took to time out. Or the server might be on fire. <laughs> I hope that error won't come up. Uh, and then we have our sort of higher level app error once again, which is sort of either a database error or a network error. Okay. And then, as Ben told us, what we can do is we can stack a bunch of monad transformers together for our application. Right? So we can say, oh, I've got, I've got an app monad here. And what's an app? Well, it's a thing which can read application configs, it can throw exceptions, which are app errors, and it might be able to perform some I.O. Uh, and then we'll use our handy dandy generalized new type deriving to give it all these wonderful instances for things like functor, applicative monad, monad reader of app config, monad error of app error, and monad IO. Right. So now we've got this great big wonderful thing, so we'd better <coughs> remind ourselves how we use it. So I'm going to give you a bit of a refresher on the MTL or the monad transformer library. <coughs> so the idea is this, we associate with each transformer a type class which specifies its operations. Right? So, for example, if we're talking about Monad Reader, the type class for the Reader T Monad Transformer, which lets you read from some kind of environment variable, configuration parameter thing, we've got this type class here 
uh, monad reader, which basically says, given our monad m, this type class tells us that there's some kind of R that that monad will let us read. And if you're not familiar with this syntax over here with the with the, the bar or pipe symbol and then the, the arrow thing, that's a functional dependency. So what that tells us is that the type M uniquely determines the R that it will let you read. Okay? And this type class, of course, has some uh, member fields within it. So there's the ask uh, action here, which basically just lets you get at the R in the context of your M. It's defined in terms of this function reader. And reader is the other member of that type class, and it's defined in terms of ask. So this is a situation where you, you implement one of these things and then you sort of end up with both of them and you can pick which one you want to implement. Um, and how would we use something like this? Well, we could write some kind of monad reader action that lets us get at the port inside of our network config. Right? So if we have an instance monad reader of network config for M, then we can get an action that, that is an M of port for any M that is a monad reader that can read network configs. So that's pretty cool. So now we've gone from talking about just one concrete monad to being able to talk about sort of any monad that satisfies this monad reader of network config constraint. Right? And oh, so this was defined in terms of reader, which is quite terse. So if we expand it out, it becomes a bit more a bit more uh, obvious what's happening here. So we're, we're calling the ask action to give us access to the network config. Then we're using the port function that we that was defined in term, that was defined in our ADT declaration to select out the the network config, right? And then we're just returning that back into the M monad. Okay. What about monad IO? Right. This is another one of these type classes for, from the MTL. So this says um, M is a monad IO if you can take an IO action that produces A's and sort of lift it up and embed it into the M monad, right? So we can we can go and perform a bunch of IO and then sort of lift it up into this M monad and, and combine it with all of our other things. So how would we use this? This isn't a very creative example. <laughs> it says, you know, if you give me a string, I can print that string out. Whoop de doo. But I can print it out with any monad that lets you do I/O, right? So we're not restricted to the I/O monad. This works for a gigantic monad transformer stack that happens to have I/O in it, right? That's pretty cool. Okay. What about errors? So here we see a pattern that's a bit similar to what we saw with the monad reader. We have again a multi-parameter type class here with uh, with a functional dependency over there. So this says that. This class says that M is some kind of monad which can throw errors, and those errors will be of type E, okay? Such that M uniquely determines the E, all right? So we have this uh, type class method here, throw error, which takes an E and puts it into the puts it into the M monad somehow. If you're a fan of parametricity, at this point you'll realize that you'll look at this thing and say, hmm, what's that A doing there? Well, that's uh, you know that's a universally quantified A. Like that's so there couldn't possibly be an A inside the M. All it could be is our E. That's really cool. But that's an aside. That can be another talk. We can also catch errors. So if we have uh, if we have an M action over here in our error throwing monad, and we have some kind of handler function which takes the E, which is our error, remember and we'll handle it in some way to produce some other M action, right? then what we can do is we can run our, our, the action on the left-hand side here, and if an error is thrown, we can handle it with this handler function to produce a resulting action. So that's what the monad error type class lets us do. Okay. And so if we, have, if we have something that might fail, uh, or it might produce an int, and we have something else that might fail, or it might produce a string, what we could do is we could use both of them. So we could try to get this, the int that might fail, we could try to get the string that might fail, and then we could call catch error over here. And we could say, well, you know, if there was an error, just give me back nothing. But if there wasn't an error, right, give me back just the tuple of the int and the string. Okay, so this sort of shows that what we can do is we can bind together a whole bunch of things that might fail 
and then handle all the errors in one spot. You know, this is Haskell. We care about handling our errors. This isn't Java. <laughs> um, so what we've really done just then is we've built up a generalized vocabulary for talking about monad transformers. So if we bring things back to our app transformer for a minute, what we've got is we've got the ask function from the monad reader type class, which will let us get at the app config inside our app. We've got the throw error and the catch error methods from the monad error type class, which let us handle our app errors, right? And we've got lift IO, which lets us embed missile launches inside our, our app monad. So what we've got is just this generalized vocabulary, right? We didn't have to write any of these things. We didn't have to call lift 20 times to get it into the right level of monad, right? That's, that's what this does, and that's why it's amazing. Okay, so now we'll move on to another example. Right, we're going to write a microservice. All it does is it loads some stuff from the database and sends it off across the network. That's what microservices do, right? Something like that. So we've got an action here, load from DB, which is in our app monad transformer. And we've got send over the network, which takes my data and produces an, an app of unit. Okay, so we can now bind these things together, right? So we can load and send, right? So we load the data from the database, which is, a, which is an action in type app that produces my data. We, and then we can bind it into send over network, which takes my data and produces an app of unit. And we've got back an app of unit. That's pretty good, right? Right? Wrong. That's not good enough. <laughs> At the very beginning of the talk, I said that one of our goals was type safety. And I'm serious about that. OK? What does load from DB do? You might think that it will load something from a database. You might believe that based on the name. But, but all you know is that it's in this gigantic app monad transformer, right? This thing might load from the database, or it might launch a missile, or it might have a look at the network config to figure out what port we're running on. It might even throw a server on fire error, right? I hope it doesn't. But, but this is, it's just no good, right? It's, we, we've thrown away most of our type safety. It just says, Oh, that's some kind of action, it'll touch my global config thing, it might throw one of my global errors. Right? That's really not good enough. We need something to fix this. Right? We need something to do something about this. So we'll bring in those type classes that we just learned from the MTL. And now we can describe our actions in terms of type class constraints rather than in terms of specific monad transforms. All right? So we've got load from DB again, okay? And now it's a monad reader of DB config, and it's a monad error of DB error, right? And it's a monad IO, because it actually needs to talk to Postgres at some point, or something like that. And, and so the monad reader gives us access to the database config. The monad error lets us throw database errors, right? So that's what load from DB can do. It's not allowed to touch the network config. It's not allowed to throw any network errors. It can't do any of that crazy stuff. This function is only to do with databases because the type tells us so, all right? Now we can define another thing, all right? Send over network, okay? So this one is a monad reader of network config, all right? And it's a monad error of a network error, okay? This is what I would expect to see, right? The network, the sending over the network function only cares about the network config and can only throw network errors. That's exactly what I want to see. Okay, so now we'll take these two functions and we'll call bind again, right? So we'll bind them together like this. Of course, right? So load and send is just load from the DB, bind with, send over network. And now, I mean, surely the talk must be over and we can all go home or something. Wrong, because that causes a type error. <laughs> Look at that! Oh no! It says network configs and db configs aren't the same thing. You can't do that. There's a functional dependency. Okay, let's go back and examine what, what went wrong here, right? So, so we've got these two, these, this instance over here, load from db, says, well, m must be some kind of monad reader that can read db configs. And send over network says, well, I, it, it must be some kind of monad reader that can read network errors. But then, when we're binding those two actions together, what we're saying is these two m's are the same m, and then these type class instances just aren't there. They can't be there because the functional dependency says that the two things that have to be the same that it can read. So we can't write this. But this is what I want to write, so we'll have to find a way around it. 
So now we're going to learn about optics. We're going to take a, a shallow dive into the ridiculously deep world of the lens library. Okay. So optics come from this package lens on Hackage. I mean, there's a rich history to them before that package was was put up there. Um, I'm sure, you know, there could be six or seven talks about optics, and then we still wouldn't really have covered even one file. Um, and so today we're just going to simplify things a bit. We're just going to talk about lenses and prisms. So these are probably the two optics that sort of more people will have heard of. And they happen to be the two that are relevant to our current uh, predicament. Okay, there are way more optics and there's way more, there's way more cool stuff in the lens library. And I encourage you to go and look at it and spend hours there and scratch your head and then go ask on IRC and get an answer you don't understand. <laughs> you know, that's what we should be doing. That's, that's awesome, right? So what is a lens, right? The fundamental question, the deep philosophical question. What is a lens? Where do they come from? Well, a lens is just a getter and a setter, right? It lets us get access to one part of a whole, right? So, so here's some, some basic functions for, for how we might use a lens, right? So if we have a lens from some kind of source that lets us get access to some kind of target, we can call the view function here, which will take that lens and give us back a getter, right? That will take our source and give us the target back. We also have a function set, which takes our lens from, from source focusing in on some kind of target, right? And then will give us a setter function, that is a function that takes a new target and the source and sort of substitutes that target into the source to produce a new source, right? So this is what a lens lets us do. But that's not a very big deal, right? I mean, if we, you know, uh, this is how we make a lens. Like if, so if you look at the way we make a lens, right? We give it a getter and a setter. And the two things I've told you we can do with a lens are to get the getter out of it and to get the setter out of it. Who cares, right? Everyone, because lenses compose. Yay! <laughs> Goal number zero, right? Lenses compose. So if we have a lens that will that will take some kind of T and let us get at the, the some kind of S, I'm sorry, and let us get at the T inside of it, and we have some other lens which will take a T and let us get some kind of U inside that, we can compose them together with friendly old dot over here and get back a lens from S that focuses in on U. Okay, I think that's really cool. And there's also an identity lens, right, which is a lens from A to A. So if you have an A and you want to get the A out of it, be my guest, right? <laughs> so now we can look at some examples of lenses and how we might go about using these crazy magical things. Right, so we've got the underscore one lens, which lets us get at the A inside of a tuple of A and B. Right, and we've got the underscore two lens, which lets us get at the B inside of a tuple in A and B. Really riveting stuff. But we can compose them. So we can say, oh, I want underscore one composed with underscore two, and that will give us access to the D that's inside, a tuple inside a tuple, right? And so if we call the view function, right? Here are some examples, right? If we call the view function on our underscore one lens, on this tuple here, which is the string hello, and then nothing, and then a three, right? It'll give us the, the thing on the left, which in this case is itself a tuple of the string hello and nothing. If we compose underscore one with underscore one to get back a new lens, right? This is the, the left thing inside the left thing. So if you're a Lisp programmer, you might call that the, the KR, or something like that, right? And that gives us the string hello, okay? So we've walked into this thing, walked into it again, and now we can focus in on that hello, okay? So that's pretty cool. We can start to talk about walking into nested structures and, and pulling things back out. But perhaps more usefully, we can set things within nested structures without going into a whole rigmarole around it, okay? So if we want to use the underscore two lens and we want to set, then we give it the number 1,000, and it will swap out the 3 on the right hand side of our tuple with 1000 because it's a lot bigger, you see, so it's better. Or we could compose underscore 1 with underscore 2, right, and then use that 
to set the nothing to just lens, right? So we've walked into this nested thing, we've swapped something out with something else, and it didn't really cost us anything. You know, it's one sh relatively short line. Okay, that's really cool. And so then we have hello, just lens, and three. So what's a prism then? Well, it's the categorical dual of a lens. Since you all obviously know what that's talking about, I can move on. <laughs> but just in case, right? So a prism is like some kind of first class pattern match. So while a lens let us get at one sort of sub piece of our whole structure, a prism lets us get at a possibility that our structure could be, right? So how do we, how do we use one of these things? That sounds very magical. Well, if we have a prism from A to B, we can use that, we can use pr the preview function to get a partial getter. So the, when we say prism AB, what we're saying is A might be a B. And so that's what this function gives witness to. It says, if you have an A, I might be able to give you a B. Maybe not. And then the really interesting thing here is this function review, which says, if you've got a prism from A to B, I can turn it around and give you a constructor in the other direction. Okay, that's really cool, right? So, and it should make sense, right? If we've got, if we're saying that A might be a B, right, then surely, if we have a B, we can make it into an A, right? How do we make a prism? We just give it those two functions, and then we have a prism, right? Again, who cares? Oh, everyone, it composes. <laughs> So if we have if we have a prism right that says that an S might be a T, right, and we have a prism that says, well a T might be a U, then we can compose them and get a prism that says, well an S might be a U. And there's an identity prism, right? You know? An A certainly might be an A. <laughs> uh, what are some examples? How do we use these things? Well, here we've got the underscore left prism, right, which lets us get at the A that might be inside of an either A or B. And we've got underscore right, which lets us get at the B which might be inside an either A or B. Okay. We've also got underscore just, which lets us get at the A that might be inside of maybe A. And of course we have underscore nothing, which sort of if our maybe thing is a nothing, then there's sort of no data to give back, so we just give back a unit. So it's a prism from maybe A to unit. Okay. So how are we going to use them? What's this going to look like? Well, we'll call preview, which lets us try to split something apart. And we'll say, we'll preview with underscore left on left of just of four, and that'll give us back just just of four. Why are there two justs here? Well, the inner thing itself is a just of four. And what we've done is we've, we've tried to see whether it's a left. In this case, it is, so we get back just the thing that was inside it. Okay? And we can compose underscore left with underscore just. We'll say, well, you know, if it's a left, and then if the thing inside that is a just, then I want to get at the A that's inside there. So we can call preview on that prism on left of just of four, and we get back just four. Now that's not the same just as this one. That's, we've walked into this just, it was a just, it wasn't nothing, and now we have our four. But the just represents the partiality of the preview function. Okay? And so, well, what if we preview underscore right on left of just a four? Well, we get back nothing. It wasn't right. What if we want to use the review function. Right. So what we can do is we can compose underscore right with underscore just and then review that onto hello. Right? And then it's given us a constructor for one of these things. That's going to come up later. That's really cool. <laughs> okay. And we can compose other things and, and review them and they'll give us a constructor that we can apply to 42. Um, and that's optics for you. So now you're all experts on the lens library. But those, those optics we were just looking at, right? I didn't see any top hats in there. I didn't see any <laughs> monocles, right? I didn't see any walking sticks. I didn't see any three-piece suits. It's time to talk about 
Classy optics! <laughs> So the idea is this, we associate with each type, a type class full of optics for talking about that type. Okay? So coming back to our DB config from way in the past, right? remember this thing? It, ha it has a database connection, it has some information about the schema. What we can do is now we can make a type class for things that have a database config inside of them. Okay? So here we're saying, you know, we're declaring a type class. Class has db config, t, where t is the type we're talking about. And, uh, you know, we have our lens db config, which lets us get at the db config inside the t. And we have the db com lens, which lets us get at the database connection inside the db config. Right? And we have the db schema, which lets us get at the schema inside of the db config, okay? Uh, and we have an instance here, right? We can give this thing a type class instance. We can say, aha, I have a type that has a db config inside of it. db config has one, right? So now, the db config lens here becomes the identity lens. The database connection here will construct the function there using the lens constructor, but that's, we're focusing on the idea here. I'm not gonna go into the technical details of, of what that's doing. Mm -hmm. And we have our DB schema lens as well, which lets us get at the DB schema inside the DB config. And now, now because we have a, an instance here for DB config, right? So we have implementations for, for getting a database connection or a database schema out of one of these things, right? Now, what we can do is revisit the type class and add these default implementations here, right? We can say, well, if you implement DB config, the lens at the top, I can give you the lens that accesses the, the uh, connection inside of it. I can give you the lens that lets you access the schema, right? Because we just use our DB config lens there and then compose it with the other ones. So when you see DB config here, right, that's talking about this one because we're composing it with the DB config lens. Okay, or well, if you're over this side of the room. <laughs> This DB con preserve uh, lens here is that one, right? It's the it's the one from this instance because we're saying, give me, you know, if I'm trying to get the database schema, well, get the DB config, and then just get its schema, right? That's the one I want. So now we have these default implementations. So we only have to define one lens to get an instance of this type class, right? That's pretty cool. And if we have a network config, which has like a port in it and some information about SSL because we're secure, right? We can do the same sort of thing, right? We can make a type class here. It has network config of T, where we can say, well, I want to be able to get the network config out. I want to be able to get the port out. I want to get the SSL out, right? And of course, once again, we can make a uh, has network config instance for network config. Okay? Right? And now, once again, because we have this, these implementations here for, for these has network config lenses, we can add default implementations to the type class. Right? So now, once again, all you have to define is this network config lens, and you'll get the other two for free. Okay, so this is sort of like saying, tell me where a network config is, and I will give you access to its parts. That's the sort of one-line summary here. Okay. So that's really all classy lenses are. Okay, it's just a type class full of lenses. I'm sorry, I lied, there's no top hats. <laughs> um, so what we can do now, because we have our type class for things with DB configs inside of them, we have our type class for things with network configs inside of them, I know something that has both of those things our higher level app config, right? That has both of these things inside of it. Well, what we can do now is we can make instances and we can say, well, an app config has a DB config inside of it, right? And we can say an app config has a network config inside of it. And all we've had to do is give these little lens definitions here. And suddenly, if now we have a vocabulary, if we had an app config for talking about the port that might be inside of it, or the database connection that might be inside of it. 
Okay, that's really cool. We're sort of flattening out our vocabulary, and now you don't have to say, you know, get this and pull it apart and get the little thing inside of it and then give me the thing inside of that and then that's what I'm after. We can just use these, these classy lenses and say, I'm after the thing all the way down there and it'll just figure it out for us. What about classy prisms, right? Maybe there'll be some top hats here. So remember we had our database error, which was either like some kind of query error with some useless text or it was like an invalid database connection or something, right? Well, what we can do is now we can make a type class as DB error for T, right? So the op so we prefix things with has when we were talking about classy lenses. Now we're prefixing them with as. We're saying we've got this type T. It might be a database error. So what are these what are these member member variables here? We've got db error, which says, you know, if you've got a t, let's it's a prism to try to get the db error out of it. We've got query error, which says, you know, if you've got some kind of db error, maybe it's a query error. I'll give you back the text, right? And we've got our invalid connection prism, which says, you know, uh, if you've got a t, like I can walk into it, get the database error, and if it's an invalid connection, I can give you back a unit, otherwise, you know, you'll get back a nothing or you won't be able to do what you're trying to do. And we can make a default instance for it here that says, oh, a database error, those can be database errors if they believe. <laughs> so we've got db error here is just the identity prism. We've got some implementations there for query error and invalid connection. And once again, you'll be getting sick of this by now. We've got default implementations for two of the type class members because we can sort of recurse down into the DB error instance, right? So we can say, look, here, I've got this, you know, if you've given me a, a prism that might let me get a DB error, I can just compose that with the, the prism to get a query error from here, right? And same thing with invalid connection, more or less, okay? So, so what we've built up now is a sort of a vocabulary to talk about sort of what, what might be, what our data might be, right? We can say, our oh, T might be a database error. But remember the other thing about prisms is we can turn them around and say, well, if we've got a database error, we can make that a T. That's pretty cool. So if you've got some text lying around and you're meant to make it some kind of query error inside of some kind of bigger error, you could say, ah, oh, well, review of query error on that text, and then it'll just be the type you want it to be and the world will be great. So we can make more classy prisms, right? We can make one for our network error. So if we have our network error that says, oh, either it'll time out with an int number of seconds or the server's on fire or whatever the case may be, we can make the same sort of type class with the same sort of members in it, we can make one of these things, the green text will come up, and then <laughs> we've got the same thing again. It's great. But that's a lot of typing. Like a couple of slides back, the text even went off the, off the page. You know, and it's all sort of this repeated pattern. I might go as far as to say that classy lenses and classy prisms might even be a design pattern for functional programming. <laughs> that's a bit strange. I don't know what that means yet. But the point of all that was, if we've got our app error, which might be a database error or it might be a network error, we can make instances and we can say, aha, an app error, well, that might be a database error. And if it is, you might be able to get at the, the invalid connection, if it's that. You, know? you might be able to get in some text that tells you why the query didn't succeed. Right? Or an app error might be a network error, right? And if it is, you, you should be able to get at the, the port that tells you what port you're running on. Maybe you're running on the wrong port. Um, I, hope you, I hope you don't get the server on fire error. Right? But if you do, you've got a prison for talking about it, so you're all set. So I mentioned before, that's a lot of typing. It went off the slide at one page. Um, there's template Haskell for that. So we can just say, make classy prisms network error, and then it expands into all this stuff. 
So if you're the kind of person who's into template Haskell, you can do that. Um, some people think it's bad juju and, and don't want to do it, but it's there, you can do it. That's up to you. Um, the same thing for classy lenses. So if we've got our database config thing, then we can just say, oh, I'll make it classy. You know. right. And then it'll just, this, this thing here is going to expand into all of this right, uh, at compile time. Why did I just talk to you about all that for all that time? That took ages and there was so much code involved. Let's all take a deep breath and get ready for the, the final excellent bit of it. <laughs> right. Remember load from DB? And remember how we couldn't bind with send over network? Remember how awful that was? Didn't that ruin your whole night? <laughs> Didn't compose, right? I told you that was goal number zero. Now, we can use our type classes from the MTL, we can use our classy lenses and our classy prisms, and we can say, aha, well, load from DB is an action which is a monad which might throw errors of type E. It, might, it will read config of type R, right? But I don't know what E is, you know, it's, it's a, a type parameter, right? I don't know what R is, right? But we do know that E can be a database error, right? And we do know that R has database config inside of it, and that's all we know, and that's important. So we know this function, we know based on the type that this function might throw a database error, might look at some database config, but it couldn't possibly look at the network config or throw any network errors, right? This couldn't tell me that the server's on fire because it's not sending anything over the network. How would it know? Right. And that's really, really cool. And this will work for any monad which satisfies these constraints. Right. And then we have send over the network, right? And it says, well, if we've got some kind of M which will throw errors that are of some type E, I don't know what they are, and it can read some kind of R's, Right, or some type of R's, then, well, as long as E can be a network error, and as long as R has a network config inside of it, I can work with that, right? That's all I need to know, okay? I don't care about whatever the rest of the crazy structure of E is, or whatever other crazy configs might be floating around in R, they're not important to me, right? And the type tells us this, and that's what's important. So now, we can take load from DB, we can load all of our data, and then we can bind it and send it over the network. Right? What, what's going to happen this time? Will it be a type error? No! We're going to take these two big piles of type class constraints and squash them together into a bigger pile of type class constraints. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> piles of type class constraints compose. Goal <laughs> <laughs> <all> zero. <laughs> right, so now, what's this? Load and send might throw monad errors of type E, and, and they might be network errors, they might be database errors, and that's all we know. And it has access to some kind of R with its reader monad, and that R definitely has a database config inside of it and a network inside of it, and that's all we know. And it might perform some IO and launch some missiles. But we did it! Look at that! That's what we wanted to do 60 slides ago! <laughs> All we had to do was go and dive into the lens library for a bit, but finally we can write that with a great super duper general type on the top of it. Well done. That's great. We win. Um, and now, if we want to make our, if we want to use this with the app monad transformer, right? I mean, it's all well and good to go and build all of these wonderful general abstractions, but then if we're never actually pushing the button, then maybe they're not so useful. But well, right, so if we have our app monad, it has all of these instances, funnily enough. We've defined them as we've gone along. Okay? And so we can call load and send at the type app. And I know that because this slide type checks. <laughs> because literate Haskell is amazing. That's really good. I'm happy with that. So in wrapping up, abstractions are strictly greater than concretions. Um, type class constraints stack up better than monolithic transformers. And Lens gives us a compositional vocabulary for talking about our data. Right. 
And that's nearly the end, because you need to go and read all these things now. So you should go and look at MTL up on Hackage, the Monad Transformer Library, which I've used extensively. You need to go and learn about Lens, and then after you've been learning about it, please come and tell me about it. And then you can look at these other things as well. There's this package Hoist Error, which lets you do really crazy things with like with your errors that go even beyond this level of, of crazy. And then um, big thanks to Ben for uh, adapting his his slides. So Ben did a talk on Monad Transformers in, in February. And he did a great big example because he's a lot more prepared than I am. But he's gone and turned that example into this classy stuff. And now you can go and look at the diff and say, well, over here everything was in this great big transformer, and over here it's all just nice constraints. Right. And he uses some other tricks that I didn't have time to talk about tonight, but they're really cool, so go and learn about it. And that's the end. Are there any questions? Can you go to bed tonight and say, I can compose things? Yes, yes I can. And I wake up tomorrow and say, I'd better compose some things. Uh, where were the whys in that one? <laughs> oh, um, every type signature about a lens or a prism. And, <laughs> um, so, how many of us were there? Were you able to send the last one? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. We'll Let's see. Yeah. Is it much of a performance impact dropping it in that way of time? Good or tell you? Uh, no, not really. Only during the compilation. Yeah. Hey, all that review and the review and the review, they all in line. There's, yeah, there's a spectacular amount of optimization put into Lens to make it pretty much go away at compile time. I don't know how that works, but Ed tells me that it works, so I'm pretty sure it works. <laughs> that's sort of, that's like the running theme to Lens. Yeah. I don't know, but Ed says it works, and it seems to. Yeah. I think they're just functions because composition is just a composition <clears throat> function. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of it's, uh, what that allows it to be. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, back up a couple of slides to pay off. Oh, this thing. Uh, uh, yeah, that was all right. I want to write a function that <laughs> has an, an action of you know, some monad m on the left of an arrow and an action of some monad n on the right of the arrow, such that the type tells me that this function handles all of the network errors in the thing on the left of the arrow. Oh, how would I do that? Gee, I don't know. Uh, so, so some kind of function. So M and N. Yeah, yeah. So, so an M, M, M A to an N A. Yeah. The type constraints have an as network error on the on M, M, but not on the N. Yeah. Um, I don't think you could do it with just that. I think you'd have to also pass in some information about how to deal with those errors and stuff. Yeah. I believe that once you're in that territory, you're starting to get into monad morphisms and stuff like that, too. Yeah, probably extensible effects. Because at that point, you start getting into problems that you actually have to know what M and N are to pull them all apart, piece them back together. The type classes alone don't help you. Uh, is this where you have to know the ordering of the transfer? Yeah, it, it gets or? icky really quickly, so you need to know. Yeah, so a simpler example than that is eliminating the reader constraint. Because with reader, like the reader part's always on the outside of your stack. So if you think of R to, R to either, you know, sort of reader outside either, yeah. and you've got R to either something or other. And that's usually the way you always want that stack. So you can say run reader T on this thing. So you use a concrete read a T to eliminate all the monad reader constraints and leave you with the E's. But I'm not sure how that, how that works with the error, whether you can eliminate the error side. I don't think you would be able to, not with this stuff. <laughs>